<laughs> okay, Nerissa, it's all yours now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Uduna. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for joining me, everybody. Um, I do apologize again for the very delayed start to this, but I do hope that this brings you a little more information and just building on what you have already gone through this past um, the past few uh, sessions. And I do hope you enjoy this more more than anything. So I think to begin with, it's you know a great um, a great time really for us to be training with CMR. Uh, I think you know it was International Heart Day recently, the 29th of September, and I think uh, this is very fitting. So let's dive straight into it. Um, I'm sure that through all of your training so far, you know, the, the basics are the planning. So we all start with these initial images and they tell you how you plan perpendicular to your left ventricle and atrium and that gives you your two chamber, go on to your three chamber or, and then your short axis and so on and so on. And then we can continue with those imaging planes and you can do ventricular outflow tracts, um, imaging of the right heart, the left heart, uh, your pulmonary valves, tricuspid valve, as you see here, mitral valve, where we often get regurg, re and as well as the aortic valve. But we want, um, obviously, something like this. Hey something that we can that we can visualize you know watching the heart pumping we can see the valve opening and closing you are assessing wall motion abnormality um, any obstruction to the flow and obviously looking for any extra cardiac pathology however this is not always the case hey we're wrong it's not always that easy so um, what, what are the things that can go wrong? What do we often see? These are not pretty images, hey. Certainly not what we want to see. Certainly not what the textbooks show us. Certainly none of the courses that show us. These are artifacts, and we really don't want to be seeing artifacts. What are these artifacts? Basically, artifacts in cardiac MR or any MRI refers to any unwanted or erroneous signals on images that basically distort the representation, the true representation rather, of the cardiac anatomy or function. And we know that these artifacts can arise from a variety of sources. The important thing is to understand them and understand how to remove these artifacts so that we can get a reliable and a clinically valuable result. That is our, our aim. Um, and so this is what this course or this presentation is aimed to help you with. Can we identify the artifacts? Do we know how to remedy them? So the basics or the three main categories of CMR artifacts are either machine or operator dependent. They can be from the patient themselves or physiological. If we move on to the MR or the, the machine op or operator related artifacts, we get the common ones, which are the zipper artifact, aliasing, the magnetic field inhomogeneities, magnetic susceptibility, chemical shift artifact, as well as the Gibbs artifact. Now, for those of us who, are, who do a lot of MR anyway, you know already the zipper artifact, magnetic susceptibility, and the basics on how we can overcome this, how we can identify them. But we will go through them again here in CMR. Patient-related artifacts, these will be dependent on patients' breathing, how cooperative they are, voluntary movements, trigger-related artifacts, as well as flow. We are imaging the heart, we know that there is the, the great vessels that are close to the heart, obviously, and the blood flow within the heart chambers itself, which all can affect our image quality. 
Before we head on to those artifacts, though, I just want to reiterate the importance of patient and coil positioning. So whether we are doing a cardiac MR or an abdominal MRI, this is something that I think as radiographers or rad techs, we have to be very aware of. So if you see, if you look at the images here, in this first window, we've got very poor signal to noise ratio. If we go into the middle window, this is a, a coronal scout image that has been repeated where the patient is moved down into the ISO center of the scanner and the coil positioned more for the heart, okay? And then if you look at the last image, this is also a sagittal view or it's very similar to our short axis um, view where we can see that anteriorly and posteriorly that the patient has been properly positioned and that coil selections are accurate. Here again, just another example of how coil selection can affect our image quality. So if we look at figure A, we've got the, the anterior coil that has not been selected. So you can see that the signal lost anteriorly more than it is posteriorly. And then in image B, we have again um, improved signal to noise ratio. And basically, the only change that was made here was activation of the anterior coil. So um, I'm happy if you unmute your, your uh, Zoom call and you can tell me if anyone knows what artifact this is, um, if you want to. Otherwise, I will continue talking. Anyone want to take a guess or any ideas? Okay, so this one is ghosting. Sorry, I, I'm sorry I missed that. But yes, this one is ghosting. I'm sure you would have guessed this anyway. We often see it in the chest wall and even in abdominal imaging. And usually it's related to poor breathing techniques, poor breath holds. Um, and it's quite an easy fix, usually. Usually an easy fix. And these generally appear as parallel lines or double contours, and they will occur throughout the image, okay? Um, like I said previously, it's due to poor breathing technique or patient motion, or even blood flow or pulsation artifact. The easiest way and the quickest ways to get through this is to coach your patient. So we are going to go through um, another slide where I will go through all the steps we can take to ensure, or all the measures we can take to ensure that your patient doesn't move on the table. But we also have to remember that we are doing a cardiac scan and quite often these patients are already compromised. They already are struggling to, um, to breathe normally. They are, they are experiencing shortness of breath. They are uncomfortable. They are in pain. And it's worse when you are lying flat. But take away all of those things. Let's say we have made sure our patient is comfortable. What else can we do? So yes, we can coach the patient. We can do single shot scans. We can use a navigator, which basically is a band that you place across the diaphragm. And that then helps to synchronize our data acquisition during certain periods of the respiratory um, phase. That does not use cardiac triggering. We can also use real-time imaging, but we must be aware that this increases the scan time and decreases the signal-to-noise ratio. I have used it personally um, in patients or in extreme cases where that was the only way we could get any sort of imaging, and it gave us a fair, a fair result. So if we move on, as I was saying before, the ways to avoid motion artifacts, the patient preparation is very, very important. So we want to make sure that our patient understands what is to be expected of them, understands what the examination is about, and ensure that the patient is comfortable. Whether you are placing a wedge underneath their knees just to alleviate the pressure of their back, that does help. We often use to stick little cushions or 
pads, soft pads under the elbows, because if you find that your patient, um, now that their arms, they lie supine, their arms are very, very flat, it becomes quite uncomfortable lying in that position for a long time. So cushions under the elbows worked well for my patients. Um, a wedge under the knees, very, very helpful. And then practice your breathing technique. So sometimes we may be, you know, quick to say to the patient, please breathe in, breathe out, and hold your breath, but we actually need to practice it with them. So stand right next to your patient. It doesn't take a long time, and you physically show them what you are expecting of them. Sometimes, though, as I was saying, some patients find it very difficult to hold their breath on expiration. If that is too difficult and you can see that your patient really isn't going to manage this, I would swap to inspiration instead. You'd find it's it's a more natural way to hold your breath. And if it's not affecting, not going to affect your images too much, or you're actually getting better image quality than on expiration, then go on to inspiration. It really makes a difference. Um, again, assess your patient status. If you see they are really not in a good state, they are really short of breath, they are in too much pain, um, then you can adjust your protocol accordingly. This is where it is important that we work as a team with your cardiologist and your radiologist. You can look at the clinical indications. What is the question that you are trying to answer? If you limit your sequences, can you still provide enough information without compromising the study? But in that way, you are assisting your patient to get through an entire study, limiting time, limiting their discomfort, and you still have something to go on in terms of a treatment plan and a diagnosis. Again, real-time imaging is an option, but we must note that the scan time does um, increase, and then you have a subsequent reduction in your SMR. So we also have trigger artifacts, which also falls under the category of motion. So this is not the patient physically moving, but the triggering um, of the ECG. And what this causes basically is a blurring of the myocardial border. As you see here, again, I've said that it is caused by a poor ECG signal um, that can be very much dependent on your electro placement, as well as patient arrhythmias. Um, the important thing to note here is that, yes, we sort of can still assess the, the wall motion. It's not very clear. It's not very pretty. And even more important, this will affect your post-processing and analysis thereafter. So remember, your stroke volumes are affected, your ejection fraction is um, affected. And that is why it is important to make sure you have nice, clear myocardial borders on your images. So how does this trigger artifact actually come about? If we remember our ECG or QRS complex, we know that, let me just point here. So data is normally acquired between this RR interval, okay? This is our QRS complex, and the RR interval is when we basically synchronize our data acquisition. Um, so the data is collected during the complete heart cycle and then retrospectively assigned to that specific phase. The arrhythmias obviously are not going to give you a regular RR interval, and that's where the problem comes or the problem arises. Again, uh, I'm just reiterating that the blurry borders make the images non-diagnostic and or may affect your post-processing and analysis. How can we avoid this trigger artifact? So um, patient preparation, again, very important. So if you've got a patient that has a lot of body hair, you take your razor, shave it off. You wipe off the moisturizer. If you've got a lot of moisturizer on the skin, your electrodes are not going to stick on very well. Um, just as a routine, we like to keep our electrodes properly sealed so that and stored away in a cool, dry place naturally. We don't want to avoid, oh, sorry, we want to avoid drying out of gel. 
because then again you get very poor signal. Remember the gel doesn't just help to stick the electrodes onto the skin, it also helps to amplify the signal. Make sure that you are using MR compatible electrodes. We don't want to have any RF burns while the patient is in the magnet. So MR compatible electrodes are an absolute must. Make sure you check those. We often use a preparation cream, which ensures better contact with the electrodes. It's a quite a, it's almost like an exfoliating cream. It feels like it has tiny granules in it, and that just prepares the skin. So what we used to do, or what we do do, is remove any excess or unwanted body hair around the electrode placement area. We then take the preparation cream, and we just give it a tiny little rub over this the area that we are interested in, and then wipe it off with a paper towel. Ensure that you have correct ECG placement. If you see that you are not getting a good ECG reading, please redo it. You, you'd rather spend those extra few minutes repositioning your electrodes and starting your scan and you know starting from scratch all over again. I would rather take that extra time initially, and then once you've started, it's just go, go, go. In terms of software, sometimes it's not necessarily the patient. There's nothing more you can do with the patient's ECG placement. It is just an arrhythmia. Patients can have atrial fibrillation and physiological complications that will cause arrhythmias. But we have software that basically rejects that portion of the, the, um, the cardiac cycle that has been captured. So it rejects the arrhythmia portion, if that makes sense. You can use single shot um, imaging, or you could also go on to prospective triggering where data is acquired during a predefined phase. The only shortfall here is that it does not cover the entire RR interval, and that again may affect your stroke volumes when it comes to your post-processing and analysis. Again, real-time imaging can be used, but we always bear in mind that this has, shows a reduction in your SNR. So in this image, image A, we've got um, a patient during um, a shock axis cine. The patient is known has known arrhythmia, and here you can see the myocardial board is quite blurry. Okay, and this is due to the arrhythmia um, that has that the patient has. Sorry, image B, we've got reduced artifacts, and for this specific patient, we use prospective gating. Okay. Does anyone want to take a guess on what this is? You can just unmute or I will continue. Is so, it pulsation? Yeah. No, not pulsation. Anyone else want to try? Okay, so this is aliasing also known as a wraparound effect. And basically this happens when your field of view is smaller than the area being imaged. So basically the region outside the field of view wraps around and is then projected on the opposite side of the image. The projected body part may cover area of interest. So if you look at image A here, it's covering basically the right ventricle. So this is no good we could possibly get away with image B because the, the wraparound now is projected outside our, our region of interest or field of view. So what are the things we can do to avoid this? Basically, the, or the easiest thing we can do is to increase your field of view. Remember, there's always a penalty if you are increasing your field of view, you, you risk increasing your scan time. And again, remember we've got a patient here, especially in CMR, where they are constantly being asked to, um, to hold their breaths and that can make them quite tight. So we don't want to increase breath hold too much. So just be aware if you are increasing your field of view, watch your scan time. You could use 
oversampling in the phase encoding direction. Um, it depends on the scanner that you are using, but basically this means that you are increasing the number of phase encoding steps. Then you could swap your phase and frequency direction. So instead of, if we go back, sorry, I'm just going to go back here to show you. So here we've got the artifact along the lateral aspect. If we swap our phase and frequency direction, you may find the artifact up there or down here and your field of view then is clear. So that is another option that you could use. And, and finally, you could apply a saturation band over the area that is wrapping in. Basically, the saturation band is going to null any signal coming from the area that is unwanted, so to speak. OK, moving on. Anyone want to guess what this is? If you can tell me what the sequence is, um, what sort of artifact and cause? Anyone feeling up to the challenge? Okay, so this is a phase contrast sequence? image. Yeah, it's a phase contrast image. That looks like a phase sequence. Contrast. Yeah. Yes, correct. And the artifact, can anyone identify the artifact? Oh, uh, Aliasi? Yes, or well the, done. The well done. And, bank. Well done. And and the cause, what would yes, yes, sorry, I didn't hear you there. It is the incorrect bank. Well done. So basically this aliasing artifact happens when the encoded velocity is different to the velocity in the vessel. So for this patient here in image A, it was quite a low vink that was used. It was a vink of 90 centimeters per second, which is quite low. If we think about the ascending aorta, the normal flow in the ascending aorta would be around 160 uh, to 180 centimeters per second. You can see here in in image B, 130 was used, which is much better. And then image C, um, sorry, image C, oh yeah, please excuse me. Okay, image C, we've got a VIG of 160, and then image D, 190. So we always want to have, we want to choose the maximum possible velocity that matches the velocity of that vessel. But just be aware that if you go too high in your bank, then yes, you're not seeing the aliasing artifact and maybe this image doesn't represent it quite well, but you will actually find that this becomes quite gray. It becomes a noisy image and then that can cause an inaccurate measurement. So be wary. I would suggest if you if you see an aliasing artifact like that, you know, you've started at 90, Yes, I would go a big jump from there. So I would have gone to probably 120 um, and then try smaller increments, but not too small. So maybe 20, 20 um, each time and then take it from there. That, that usually works for me. And again here, so this one was a patient who, a 16-year-old girl who had a tetralogy of fallow and she had that repaired. She was then sent in for um, a flow assessment of pulmonary valve. And here, sorry, the resolution is not great on this image, but here they started with a length of 200 centimeters per second. You can see the aliasing artifact. And they didn't do too many jumps or increments in between, but instead went straight on to 300. And you see that the aliasing artifact is not there anymore. So basically, sorry, is there a question? No, sorry, I can go ahead. Okay, all right. So these yellow circles are basically what's used during the post-processing. Um, you basically put your ROI over the valve area, and these are the curves that you get. If you look at the first one where the vent was incorrectly chosen, you are not getting an accurate measurement, okay? Our curve should not look like that at all. 
Okay, moving on. Can anyone take a guess on this one? No takers? Okay, so this one it is related to blood flow. So we know the heart is constantly moving, but we've got we've got great vessels that are lying in close close proximity. So the the, the speed of the vol velocity of the protons within these vessels, they cause a blood flow artifact. Basically, looks a lot like the, the, the ghosting artifact, except that it's not going to go through your whole image. Rather, the, rather it goes over or, or close proximity to the, the, the area of interest. How do we get rid of this? So how do we reduce it? You can use shimming. You could reduce your TE and TR. Again, you could swap your phase and frequency. So if we look at this image, if I swap my phase and frequency, the image artifact would be along the lateral aspects, okay, in the posterior element of the chest, and our gray vessels and our heart would be unaffected. You could also use a saturation band, and you could adjust, adjust your slice selection. Also be aware when you are when you are applying saturation band that can increase your scan time. So just make a note of that or be aware of be aware of it rather. So the blood flow is the blood flow artifact isn't necessarily a bad thing. Okay. If we look at this image, does anyone want to tell me what's going on here? Uh, I mean I, I see I've already probably put up a a heading so it's easy to see is mitral valve regurgitation so here we are basically exploiting um the blood flow artifact and this gives us a nice clear indication or a, a visual representation of the blood flow or the regurgitation into the left atrium so while yes it is an artifact and usually we don't want artifacts this is a nice way to represent the mitral valve regurgitation. So the zipper artifact, this one um, as an MR radiographer or an MR tech, you would have come across at some point, um, hopefully not in your department, but generally um, during a course or in your textbooks, um, any online um, education material. Basically, you find these uniform stripes that are throughout all your images. So you won't find it on just one image. It will be on all images in all sequences. And this usually happens when there is a leak in your RF shielding, or it could be malfunctioning of the hardware or external factors, such as an open door or an open window. Generally, there isn't an, a window in your MR room, but it could be that the cabin door hasn't been shut properly. You could have monitoring equipment that is in the room that is not MR compatible, and that could cause this virus interference, or it could be a faulty light bulb. I think more over um, or over the years, people are more aware when doing installations that they don't use um, light bulbs that are going to cause this sort of issue. Okay, moving on. This commonly occurs in abdominal imaging as well. Um, not necessarily specific to cardiac, but we do see it often. Does anyone want to take a guess? Okay, this is a chemical shift artifact. And it basically, as I said, it is a common artifact. And it appears as a dark band, as you see here or in this case, another dark band here. And it basically occurs at um, a fat and water interface, okay? So it normally occurs in the frequency encoding direction. And it basically is a result of the different resonance frequencies between fat and water because they resonate at different frequencies, but they are lying in such close proximity and the area or the, the voxel that you are imaging at that point has both the fat and the water protons in it that causes the chemical shift artifact. It is very common on a 3T, 
So if any of you are standing on 3D, I'm sure you have come across this artifact and it's not a very pretty one, but there are things we can do too um, to remedy it. Again, just a reiteration that it appears that the interface between the fat and water-based tissues, there are two types of chemical shift artifacts. The first one is basically caused by a misres. I beg your pardon. The first one is basically caused by a misregistration of the signal from the fat and water protons that are present in the same voxel along the frequency encoding direction. The difference in resonance frequency between fat and water causes a separation in the reconstructed images, basically a pixel shift. So if, um, or rather the degree of the pixel shift depends on the receiver bandwidth used. In general, a higher bandwidth is associated with a smaller pixel shift. So what we can do to avoid this is decrease your slice thickness, increase your bandwidth, and you could use fat suppression. The second type, basically, is caused by defacing of the fat and water protons, and it basically causes signal cancellation. So here we have a fat saturation um, pulse that has been applied. The first image, image A, we've got fat saturation on, and you can clearly see the fat in the chest wall. In image B, we've got, we don't have fat saturation. Fat saturation has been turned off. And you can see a chemical shift artifact, basically where the, the signal from fat is moving forward and backwards here. So it's causing a displacement, so to say, in the fat signal. Okay, here again, just, just to show you the blood flow artifact, um, we, it doesn't affect the actual image too much, but if you look here over the great vessel, there is distortion of that great vessel. And this image, sorry, just a second. Here in image B, this white arrow basically indicates a chemical shift artifact, and it's surrounding a thrombus in the the left particular apex. Moving on to our next slide. Um, this is a video. Let's see it's playing. Okay, so watch closely and I will just pause it at the end before I continue talking. If he wants to give me a Okay, I'm just going to pause it there. Does anyone want to have a go at this one? You can tell me, I mean, easy to identify the sequence, but what is happening? What are we, what are we looking at? Where's my little cursor pointing to? Okay. Basically, this is a first pass perfusion. Um, the, the top row is done with adenosine. Um, it's a stress perfusion study, and the bottom one is done at rest. And if you look here, there is a dark rim. You can see it up here, you can see it here, and a little bit in that screen. But down here, we're not, we're not seeing that at all. So this is a telltale sign. Basically, what it can be misidentified as is the dark room artifact, okay? And this commonly occurs at the intersection of the blood pool and myocardium. So you've got the blood pool, which is quite bright now because of our contrast in there, and then you've got the dark myocardium. And then you get the subendocardial ring, which could, as I said, um, it could misrepresent a perfusion defect but it can be easily differentiated to an experienced MR tech or radiologist. Um, 
basically in a perfusion. I'm going to be back, going back to this to the video. If you are closely in the video, you will see that the perfusion. Vision defect lasts. So, Narissa, sorry, you broke again. up. Do you want to repeat what you just said? Sorry. Uh, where, where did you lose me? Um, right before you played the video. Okay. I, yeah. I'm to, okay. So, I'm just going back to this slide to show you how you can tell whether it is a perfusion, a true perfusion defect, or if it is um, a dark rim artifact. So usually in a perfusion defect, it will continue. You will see that perfusion defect throughout the throughout the cine or throughout the perfusion acquisition. Whereas with a dark rim artifact, it usually um, only lasts a few heartbeats. Okay. So this video, I'm going to just say again that this skin defect is it throughout. Can you not see it down because this, this is done at rest, this is done with stress. Okay, the solution for, for the dark room artifact is to increase your signal to noise ratio. But remember again, when you are increasing your SNR, you do increase your scan time. As I said, if it's if you if you're an experienced MR tech or if you have a radiologist with you and you can easily identify the difference. Um, between the, the dark room artifact and your true perfusion defect, then there isn't really a need to repeat this scan. Again, we've got the dark rim artifact here. Um, if we look at the top row, we've got um, a comparison between the dark rim artifact and the real perfusion defect at the bottom. It's from two different patients, okay? So from left to right, we've got contrast arrival here in the left ventricle, and then here into um, the myocardium, and then recirculation. Again, as I said, the DRA or the dark rim artifact usually lasts only a few heartbeats, while the real defect tends to be more persistent. So here we can see it here, while you, you've got your blood pool there. Here's the dark room artifact, and here in recirculation, you've still got the dark room artifact there. Okay, these ones are easy to identify. Any takers? That's not a ghost in? Mm, no. No, we can try a uh, phase wreck, maybe? I, I do brain. I don't know much about cardiac. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So these are susceptibility artifacts. And in the first picture, we've actually got a patient wearing a bra. So these clips, the bra clips, is what's causing these two little susceptibility artifacts at the back. That's, that's crazy that you would put a patient on the table for a cardiac scan with the bra. I don't understand how that happened. Nevertheless, it did happen and it was caught on the images. Here we've got a patient with an um, implanted um, cardiac monitor. And again, we can see that susceptibility artifact here. So how do we fix this? Just more examples here. You can see this one is causing quite a big artifact. Here, it's not too bad. Um, we can still see in this dark blood image, but obviously, if, if we scroll, have to scroll down further, we may see more artifact over the area of interest. Um, basically, these are susceptibility artifacts, which are caused um, or as a result of the V0 in homogeneities and then coupled with the medical device in, in place as well. Um, this is an insertable cardiac monitor in axial plane. Um, and we are seeing image obviously of just the great vessels just above the heart. And the banding artifacts we can see is less pronounced when you use a haste sequence here. Okay? So it's quite significant there, here much, much less.
again, susceptibility artifact. This is a gradient sequence, and really, I mean, we are we are obscuring the whole of the left, um, the apex of the left ventricle there. The patient also has some sternal wires, as you can see, causing artifacts there. As you've seen in previous pictures, those artifacts occur as, or they, they look like circular bands or a blooming artifact, and basically is caused by the phasing of spins. What we can do to remedy it is to use shimming. You can use past spin echo sequences instead of the gradient echoes, and you can also add a saturation band over the implanted device. Remember again to watch your your scan time if it does increase, especially with the addition of a saturation band, as well as your SAR. So if you are scanning on a 3T, you will find that the SAR can become quite problematic. Um, what we do is at the start of the scan, we switch from first level to normal mode, and that usually keeps your SAR at bay and you don't have any issues while scanning. Otherwise, you will find that you cannot continue your measurements. So just be, wa be wary of that. OK, and here we've got another susceptibility artifact. And these, um, these show a patient who's had a coronary, bypass, a coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, and the artifacts that we see here are caused by metallic surgical clips. Okay that artifact there, which is placed at the proximal anastomosis to, anastomosis to the aorta. If we look at the four chamber view here, it shows a round area that is, you know, devoid of signal and like a crest-like rim of um, higher signal intensity, which is typically a metal-related artifact, okay? That's within the right atrium. On the cross-sectional view, um, here, this dotted line, if you look just above it, that could be mistaken for a lesion, okay? But obviously, when you are imaging, we always image in different planes, and that is to make sure that we are not misinterpreting what we see. Patient history is also very important. Okay, I'm not sure, again, how many of you scan on 3T, if anyone does, but this is a common occurrence on um, 3D scanners where you have off resonance artifacts. So um, the nicer scanners uh, or the newer software, sorry, have um, a frequency scout. So we normally run this before we go ahead with our cines. So what we normally do is acquire all our axials through the, the chest and then we focus on doing our scouts. And before doing our true cines, our true four chamber and short axis cines, we run an off resonance or um, a frequency scout rather. So if we look here, it's giving us the frequency, okay? And if you look at the images, you can see the artifacts. I mean, that's really over the valves, but even going into the atria and the ventricles. So that's no good. Here, it's terrible. Oops, sorry. Oh my word, sorry guys. I'm having finger trouble tonight. Okay, getting back to the slide. So we've got a lot of artifact here that we do not want. It is obscuring the, the, the entire heart basically. Here we can see the atria a little better. We can see the myocardium, but still way too much artifact over the ventricles. Getting much better here, a little better here. I would have gone with 160 hertz um, to remove this artifact, and that would have been the best. Um, so basically, it's a frequency shift technique, uh, and you have a progressive increase in the frequency. And it shows the image basically shows you a gradual shift in the position of the dark band, the dark band artifact, or looks like a dark band. Okay, and then right up until we get 100. 260 hertz, where we no longer see the dark band. Okay, and that brings me to my conclusion. So basically, I just want to reiterate that we know CMR is a powerful tool, but it is also um, really, really important for us to recognize and understand the potential for artifacts. 
Um, again, we've said before that it can compromise accuracy of diagnoses as well as treatment plans. Remember, if you cannot get an accurate diagnosis, how do you treat your patient? Again, very important to work together with your radiologists and your cardiologists because they will help you address the concerns. And sometimes you may not necessarily identify an artifact immediately, but you will find working together um, and being able to identify your artifacts timely and having an action or a plan to remedy it will definitely ensure your highest quality in CMR studies. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'm here. And these are my references if anybody wants to look it up. Fantastic. And a little bit of humor. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> that's <been> good. <laughs> Yes, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Larissa, and a very yeah. nice way to end that. Um, if you have any questions, uh, can you please uh, put that in chat and we will take that, that up. Um, we do appreciate your patience in staying with some of the um, uh, you know connection issues, but we're great that we're able to um, sort of get, uh, get this going. So uh, questions, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. You can also type it in chat. Okay, let's just give them some time, see, monitor the questions. Uh, so there's a question about the frequency shift. How many degree is um, on average, I think, uh, if I'm guessing what the question is, how many degrees on average is there a frequency shift before you start to notice an artifact? If that's the right question. Um, I can't tell you really. There is, a, you know, from my experience, I will have to, to look at what the literature says but from my experience there isn't really an average you really it's very patient dependent um so you basically going on what your frequency scout shows you um and you choose the best the best image from there i'm sorry if that doesn't answer your question very well oh harrison does that answer your question oh okay so i just wanted to um get a clear understanding is frequency sheet actually um an artifact or a means of correcting an artifact? Um, it is an artifact that we usually find on a three Tesla. So if you are scanning on a 1.5 T, um, then you, you wouldn't really experience it. Remember, the, 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 the higher field strength causes more inhomogeneities. Um, and yeah. when your patient is lying in the magnet, that is when you get those um, frequency disturbances. Um, so if do you scan on a 1.5 T or a 3 T? A 3 T, a 3 T. 3 T, so have, have you come across this artifact? Yeah, because when I come across it, the, um, the what, what we do is they do a frequency shift of about 70 degrees. Now, okay. some, some person say 60 degrees, some person say 70, some person say I'm, I'm trying to get the average. Now it sounds to me like it's, a way of correcting an artifact that you use mainly in the short axis when you do your scouts for post-contrast. It's just like you are correcting an artifact, but now you are giving me a new understanding. Maybe I, I will have to go with more needs to know, to know what okay, to do. Yes, so this normally we would do at the very start before your sinis. Um, so, you know, after you do your transaxial throughout the chest, and yeah. when you go in to plan your sinis, this is when we would do it to make sure that your sinis come out all perfectly beautiful without that frequency shift artifact. Um, oh, I see the Yes, thank you. Thank you for thank your question. You. Thank you very much. I see the next question says here, in the absence of MR compatible ECG, can we use normal electrodes? Um, so I would, I would strongly advise against that. I haven't personally used them and I'm not sure if they would work because you would obviously need um, your MR or your electrodes generally are very vendor specific. So depending on what ECG monitoring system you are using. But besides that, the most important factor is that you could induce RF burns. And I would, I would strongly advise that, advise against it. 
Um, Adwale is asking me if we can use navigator sequences for white blood images. Um, yes, you can use if your scanner allows it, but then remember again that you have um, a reduction in your SNR um, and as well as an increased scan time. So it is just very much patient dependent and um, yeah, you take it from there, unfortunately. This is really fantastic. Um, any other questions? We've still got four minutes and then uh, we will thank Narissa for our time. So is there any other questions at all? So Narissa, while they're waiting, um, I, we do face contrast for brain imaging and I did recognize that velocity encoding artifact um, that you showed because that's we, we, we see that quite common, especially when we're trying to do uh, face contrast on um, on animals because we do a lot of animal research here um it's not clear sometimes to i mean we set up arbitrary um vinac uh values uh it's it's like a trial and error um and so what yes. happens when you have a patient that has um like arrhythmia or some other um, um cardiomyopathy that makes it very difficult for you to quickly on on the fly evaluate what the right velocity encoding should be so um, what I, I did actually is I just, and, and I'm, I'm going to be totally honest here, I Googled what is, what is the average velocity? What should I expect? And that would be my starting point. So if you see the big aliasing artifact, then you just go in your increments from there. Remember, if, you are got, if, you've, if you've chosen a very high uh, VENC, you're going to get a gray. So where the blood pool is, you should have that nice bright or white blood. When it starts going gray and noisy, you know you are too high. And you don't want to be too high because that causes um, inaccurate measurements. Obviously, if you're too low, you will have the aliasing artifact. So you just you sort of have to gauge how much of the aliasing artifact is in there. Even, even in the brain, um, I would you know do the same. I would look up what the normal or reference values are and you use that as my guide yeah okay that that makes very that makes sense and you know it, we didn't talk a lot about um uh, software using software post-processing to compensate or correct for artifacts um are there artifacts that can be post-processed um that you don't have to either reacquire or or do other yeah in my experience, no, and, and I think it's very much advised against because um, you don't want to cause any misinterpretations, but if uh, I'm being honest, no, we've never post-processed. I, I suppose the only thing I would post-process is if there was an aliasing artifact and I would crop it out. Anything else I would repeat because, you know, you really don't want to... Um, you really don't want to cause any um, confusion or misinterpretation. Right, yeah. If, I guess the, the reason I was asking this is there's a lot of work in motion artifact and being able to use um, uh, deep learning AI. and AI, yeah. To, and I think that's yeah. the one that kind of pops into my mind. There's also some work in susceptibility yeah. artifacts as well and phase on wrap in yeah. and all that stuff. But I guess you're right. I mean, if you can rescan, that's the best option is to find, it's to be able to catch an artifact before the patient leaves, rescan if you can and yeah. Yes, and, and also, um, you know, I think this um, using the AI is not widely available at the moment. Um, and I, I certainly don't have any experience with it. So if it's something, you know, in, in the near future, it sounds amazing where we can reduce patient uh, time on the table by using post-processing, then we're all for it. I mean, we've seen that, ha you know, that being done in, um, in other uh, body parts. So why not in the heart? But I think maybe just my strong opinion or biased opinion, I would really avoid it. I, I think I'd need to really be convinced to use AI in terms of um, correcting artifacts. Yeah. Fantastic. This is actually a nice way, a nice place to end. Um, Larissa, <laughs> we're so thankful that you were able to provide this to us. Um, we will. Thank this has been recorded. So um, the one, because again, we run this um, obviously during different uh, different time zones, and some texts are also working. 
So we will um, uh, put this up. And if there's any questions that do come arise from uh, people watching this on demand, we're much happy to forward it to you and um, continue the conversation. So thank you so much um, for your time. And uh, we really look forward to continue working with you um, on a lot of the training efforts that we do. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Again, I do a 